Today we're going to look at a man named Naaman. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to 2 Kings chapter 5. And we're going to read this, this passage here completely through. And then we're going to come back and we're going to break it up and look at a few specific verses. Uh, but 2 Kings chapter 5, let's go ahead and read verses uh, 1 through 14 as we... Well, let me just go ahead and read that. The king of Aram had great admiration for Naaman, the commander of his army. Because through him, the Lord had given Aram great victories, but, through, but though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy. At this time, Aramean raiders had invaded the land of Israel, and among their captives was a young girl who had been given to Naaman's wife as a maid. One day, the girl said to her mistress, I wish my master would go see the prophet in Samaria. He would heal him of his leprosy. So Naaman told the king what the young girl from Israel had said. Go and visit the prophet, the king of Aram told him. I will send a letter of introduction for you to take to the king of Israel. So Naaman started out carrying as gifts 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. And can someone say poor donkey or poor horse? Because that's a heavy load. The letter to the king of Israel said, with this letter I present my servant Naaman. I want you to heal him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes in dismay and he said, This man sends me a leper to heal? Am I God that I can give life and take it away? I can see that he's just trying to pick a fight with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes in dismay, he sent a message to him saying, Why are you so upset? Send Naaman to me and he will, he will learn that there is a true prophet here in Israel. So Naaman went to his horses and chariots and waited at the door of Elijah's house. But Elisha sent a messenger out to him with this message. Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and you will be healed of your leprosy. But Naaman became angry and he stalked away. I thought he would certainly come out to meet me, he said. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call on the name of the Lord his God and heal me. Aren't rivers of Damascus and Abana and far, far, far better than the rivers of Israel? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? So Naaman turned and went away in a rage. But his officers tried to reason with him and said, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? So you should certainly obey him when he simply says, Go and wash and be cured. So Naaman went down to the Jordan River, and he dipped, and he dipped, and he dipped, and he dipped, and he dipped. All his sins were washed away, washed away. <laughs> I'm just going to see how many of you guys are old school this morning. That's all I'm doing. And he dipped and he dipped seven times, and his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child, and he was healed. The title of the message this morning is going to be, When Life Gets Complicated, Keep It Simple. When Life keeps, Gets Complicated, Keep It Simple. Let's break this story down and look at a few key points here. Uh, I don't have a three-point message, but I just have some thoughts I want to share with you uh, this morning. First off, looking back at verse number one. We see here that uh, because through him the Lord had given Aram great victories. I just got to make a brief point right there that, that it didn't say uh, through Naaman great victories came. It said through Naaman the Lord gave Aram great victories. And the point I want to make real quickly is we need to learn to live our lives in such a way that, that God gets all the recognition for every success we could possibly have in life. You know, you hear a lot of people at the award ceremonies. If you have, and I'm, I'm I don't want to judge, but, 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 but given the fact of some of the, the people who thank God in the ceremonies, um, they don't appear to, to, to serve God in other areas of their life. That's all I'll say about that. But they're willing to say, thank God, I couldn't have done it without God. And if they can say it, then how much more should we as, as Christ followers, as disciples of him, say, you know what, God, I can't have success apart from you. I owe you all credit for any success I might have. Just a quick thought there. So your name in this, uh, he's won great victories. The Bible says in verse 1 that he's a mighty warrior, but he suffers from leprosy. And it may not have specifically been leprosy because the word used here actually can mean other uh, skin conditions. But, but regardless of that, Naaman has a, a skin disease. He's a great warrior, but he has a skin disease. And here in, in Bible times, those that are lepers and those who have skin diseases are outcasts in, in the world. Nobody wants to be around them or touch them. And, and here Naaman is, I don't know how many people are aware of his skin condition, but, but I see when he puts on his armor, nobody can see his skin condition. When he puts on his armor, he looks like a great warrior and a mighty warrior. But, but what they don't realize is when he goes home and he takes off his armor, he starts itching like crazy because that skin disease is bugging him. But all people see is the armor. 
And we talked a little bit about that last week, about how all we see about some people's lives is, is the highlight reel. We don't see the nitty and gritty. You know, we always look at our lives sometimes, and, and if we're not careful, we can wish that we have what other people have. But, but listen, they got their struggles too. They have struggles too. No one can avoid troubles in this life. The grass might look greener on the other side, but guess what? It still needs to be mowed. Still needs to be mowed. So here Naaman is. He has this skin disease. He's a valiant warrior. And something happens in verses 2 and 3. At this time, Aramean raiders, uh, they invade the land. And here they take captive. In their invasion, they take captive a young girl from Israel and bring her into Naaman's house. And she becomes uh, basically a slave, a servant of Naaman's wife. And so here this young girl is. She has just been pulled from her family. Just been yanked from her hometown, from the comforts and the security of her own home. She has been plucked out of and placed in this. But, but then as a result of her being yanked, she finds herself in a position to where she can profoundly impact the kingdom of God. And the point I want to make there is, is the fact that God can take your misfortunes and he can turn them into good fortune. He can take your misfortunes. You can feel like that girl and you've gotten plucked out of some things in life. But maybe that plucking can actually work out for the better of you. Maybe that plucking can help you more than it's hurt you. Maybe that can give you beauty for ashes. That's what his word says. He said, I'll give you beauty for ashes. He'll turn your, tri or your tragedy into a triumph. And I look at this about Naaman and I said, man, God must have really loved Naaman. To, to have taken a girl from Israel to bring it to his house just to meet the need in Naaman's life. And God will do the same thing for you. God loves you so much that he's willing to send someone from a faraway land or to send something from far away to come to you and to meet that need and fulfill whatever need uh, you have in your life. I think about my wife and I when we first uh, met. For those who don't know the story, I'll give you the brief version of the story. Uh, we were... Uh, there was a, a West Tennessee, Henning, Tennessee, a small town is where I was attending church. And we needed a youth pastor. And, and they hired a man from California, of all places, bring him all the way from California to a small town, Tennessee, to be a youth pastor. Well, he's our youth pastor, and I'm in college at the time. And for a few years, and then when he moves, he goes to the church where Valerie's dad is pastoring. Now, now God knew that Valerie had a need in her life. <laughs> She needed a good man, a godly man, a righteous brother. And, and so he sent a man from California, and his daughter played matchmaker. And, and, and as a result, the rest is history, as they say. Now we're, we're happily married with four little ones running around. And, and so God met Valerie's need that day. He met mine, too. Come on. I can't say it. He met he probably met mine more than he met hers. I, I, I'll just leave it at that. God is so concerned with our needs. He's so concerned with the things that are heavy on, this, on our hearts. The Bible tells us in Peter to, to cast all our cares on him. Because why? Because he cares for you. He cares for you. You might not know how to ask God for something. You might not even know what to ask God for a lot of times. But God, in his omniscient sovereignty, will give you above and beyond what you could possibly ask or even think. That's what Ephesians 3.20 says. He says, I will give you exceedingly and abundantly above all you can ask or even think. So just when you're at the point where you think that disease or that physical condition is getting the best of you, God will, will send the cure. Just when you're at the point to where the stress and the depression is almost too much to take, God will send someone or something to begin to lift that burden in your life. Just when you think you're about to crumble financially, God will provide a ram in the thicket. He'll make a way out of no way. He'll bring somebody from far off just to bless you. He'll send someone along your path because God will always show himself faithful in our lives. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13 says, If we are faithless, anybody been there? If we are faithless, then he will remain faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Even when you're faithless, God will remain faithful. He will send a person or he will send a sign to show the way. I look over my life and there's been so many signs. So many things that God has used uh, through people and through nature just to speak to me that it would take hours to tell it all. Uh, you know, I'm a, I, I'll tell you a story. One of the stories is about cardinals. I love cardinals. Don't you, Jenny? Jenny loves cardinals. Jenny's the St. Louis Cardinals fan. I love cardinals because I'm a, 
I was in I was in West Tennessee where, where uh, St. Louis was four hours and Atlanta was six hours. So I was kind of a hybrid. I was a Braves and a Cardinals fan. If you could be such a thing, uh, you can't. Okay, well I tried. I was a Braves and a Cardinals fan. But but there's a story about Cardinals that, that God really spoke to me, and I, I'll share that here. And, and, and as I share that, in all seriousness, as, as I was preparing, as I was studying, and God reminded me of this story, I really feel like this is going to bless someone. I feel like somebody in here uh, really needs to hear uh, this testimony from our own life. I think it's going to minister to you. Um, Valerie and I, when we first uh, were called out of youth ministry, we were youth pastors for, I guess, 10 years or so. And, and I won't tell it from, from our story because there's so many details. I can't even express it all. I'll, I'll just tell it from my side of the story. And Valerie can tell her side uh, to you some other time. But from my side of the story, I knew God had called us or was calling us out of youth ministry. And I really felt, felt strongly uh, he was calling us into a, a lead pastor, a senior pastor role, which was intimidating to me because I had no experience in senior pastoring. And God, that's, I've never, I don't know if I can uh, handle that or, or accomplish that, but I know when he calls you to do something, he'll equip you uh, to do what he's called you to do. And so here we are. I know this calling is there. I decide to take a step of faith. We decide to take a step of faith. And so I step out. I step out of the boat. And I went through this period to where as I stepped out of the boat, I was really stepping into the unknown. And, and, and when I stepped out, nothing seemed to happen. See, any time that God calls you to take a step and then you end up taking that step, but when you take that step, nothing's there, that's tough. Have you ever been there? God calls you to take a step. You take it. But what did you step into? Yeah, come on. What did you step into? You can't see it. God, I'm here, but nothing has changed. Because I thought when we took a step out, we would immediately step into senior pastor. Little did I know God would take us on an 18-month hiatus or, or time to prepare us for what lies ahead. So we were waiting. We took the step, but... But we were waiting, and after some time uh, of waiting, you just begin to wonder, God, should I regret even taking that step? You know, God, would, would life have not been easier had I just not taken that step? And we wonder if we should even regret that, but something inside of us won't allow us to regret it because we know that that step was an obedient act to God and to His will, and so we know we're faithful in that. But here we are, we're, we're stuck in this moment of just not understanding and not knowing where God is leading us. And that's a difficult place to be in. Because in that moment, you're just hanging on to his word. That's all you have. But that's enough. That's enough. It's all you have, but it's all you need. His word is all you need. And so in this moment to where it's, 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 it's tough. We made a decision to step. Nothing's happening. We can't see where God is leading us. It's, it's just, it's starting to get a little discouraging. I'm starting to wonder if maybe we just need to throw in the towel on this whole ministry thing, uh, just to be totally candid with you. And, and, and through this time, God begins to speak to me through the Cardinals. And let me give you the backstory on the Cardinals. Prior to this, the Cardinals had just won uh, the World Series in, in that year. And to give you an idea of what was going on in that World Series, because this was a very unique World Series, uh, they were playing the Rangers. And uh, Jenny, I know you love this story. And so the Rangers uh, were playing the Cardinals. And here it is, the bottom of the ninth inning. For those of you who are baseball fans, the bottom of the ninth inning. Uh, the, the Cardinals are down by two. If, if they can't score here, they lose the game. There's two men on base, and, and the batter has two strikes on him. That means one more strike, and he's done. Game over. Two strikes. The pitcher pitches it. David Fries is the batter. He hits the ball in the outfield. Hits a triple, scoring the two runs and tying the game. What an incredible comeback to tie the game in the bottom of the ninth. So they go into extra innings. And they go into the 10th inning, and the Rangers just put two runs on the board. Boom. It's like, oh, man. So here the Cardinals find themselves again, bottom of the 10th now. Same position they were in last inning. Down by two runs. What are they going to do? They score a run by, by one, one batter towards the end of the lineup. The first of the lineup comes up. They walk out of two holes. And you, for those who know Albert Pujols, you know why they walked him. And Lance Berkman steps to the plate. There again, down by one at this moment. Two outs, two strikes. One strike is all the Rangers need to win this game. So they throw the pitch, and, and Berkman hits a single, scoring the man on third. And they tie the game once again. <sighs> Hang on. Let's go to the 11th inning. They go to the 11th inning, and they shut the Rangers out. The Rangers can't score. David Freeze comes back to bat for the Cardinals in the bottom of the 11th inning. Hits a home run, a solo home run to win the World Series for the Cardinals. And the crowd goes wild. <laughs> 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 
imagine that? Down by two. Never before has there been a team that has came back in the World Series after being down by two in the ninth and the tenth inning. It was a, a world record. It had never happened before. And the whole story of that is just when everybody was getting excited and said the Cardinals are done, two outs, all the Cardinal haters were like, it's over, they're done. They hung in there. Tenth inning, it's over, they're done. They hung in there. Eleventh inning, they pulled out the victory. And in this moment, as I'm kind of discouraged and I'm kind of, you know, de depressed about taking the step, but God is just not showing up in the situation, uh, that's in the back of my head. I'm not really trying to think about cardinals. I'm not looking for cardinals. I'm just, I'm just living life. And I look out the back door of our house, and there's like four or five cardinals standing in my yard. <laughs> now, you know, you see cardinals every now and then fly by, but you don't see them in groups. So. And God showed a group. He, God has to get the message across somehow. A little, I'm a, I'm a little thick-headed sometimes. I can be stubborn, so God has to use some pretty drastic measures. And, and immediately when I saw the Cardinals, immediately the Holy Spirit brought up that game. And he said, it's not over yet. It's not over yet. Bottom of the ninth, two outs, but it's not over yet. You're still in this thing. I'm still going to bring the victory. I'm still going to turn things around. And I want that to encourage you this morning. Maybe next time you see a Cardinal, because I'm starting to see him again. Uh-oh, look out, somebody. I'm starting to see cardinals again. And maybe in your life, the next time you see a cardinal this week, I want you to think about that step that you take, that you've taken, that, that God hasn't appeared to show up in yet. And let that be a general reminder that it's not over yet, that he's, he's going to send whatever he needs to send to, to help you keep the faith, to show himself faithful uh, in your life. Let's move on. Uh, verse number four uh, through seven, we see where this girl tells uh, Naaman to, to go see this prophet in Israel. And, and Naaman, you know, he, he petitions the king. King says, great. He sends a letter uh, to the king of Israel saying, hey, you know, Naaman needs to be cured of leprosy. And the king of Israel uh, doesn't like this. He says, what can I do about the situation? I'm not God. I can't cure leprosy. You're trying to pick a fight, big boy? You're trying to pick a fight? He was getting upset about it. And I look at that situation. I think it's kind of funny because I, I look at our own lives when we have problems, when we have issues, when we have struggles that are complicated. A lot of times we, we tend to go to the wrong people to try to get the answers. We tend to go to the wrong people. They, the, the letter had no business being sent to the king of Israel because he can do nothing about that they needed to see. see. But he's looking to the wrong person for help. I think about Job and his three friends who thought they were helping him, but really they were making things worse. They were making it worse with friends like that who needs enemies, right? Who needs them? If anybody's advice to you removes God from the equation, then that's bad advice. If their advice removes God from the equation, don't take that advice. The only way to solve a problem that's bigger than you is to enlist the help of a God that is bigger than you. That's the only way to solve a problem. And people in this life, they mean well. I know we mean well. And sometimes it's good advice. Sometimes the advice they give you is good advice. But there are certain complications in your life that you don't just need good advice. You need God advice. You need some God advice. You need to know the right answer. The, 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 you need to go to the person that can provide the only answer uh, that you need. And so here Elisha is. And, and in verse number 8, uh, we see where he, he says, send him to me. And, and see, he's upset that the king... Uh, well, I, I say he's upset. A little backstory on this. King Joram, the, the one that's the king of Israel at the time, who's tearing his robes and he's upset because he says, I can't cure leprosy. And he's getting all frustrated. Um, Elisha doesn't have a good track record with Joram. Uh, a couple of chapters back, I think in chapter 3, is when Joram and Jehoshaphat and another king approach Elisha. And Elisha pretty much tells Joram to his face, if it wasn't for Jehoshaphat, me and you wouldn't be talking. He don't like it. Joram, because Joram is not following in the ways of God. He's the king of Israel, but he's not following in God's ways. And so Elijah has a little bit of a, a little bit of an angst or a little bit of bitterness or something there towards Joram. And then in that moment when Joram is stressing out, saying, Why is he picking a fight with me? Elijah could have sat back and snickered and said, You know what? That's what you deserve. You, you, need, you need a little bit of you need somebody to pick a fight with you. You need to, to stress out a little bit, because I don't like you anyway. Because what Elisha did is that he said, send them to me. Because we should never let our opinions of other people keep us from doing what God has called us to do. We talked about that last week. Well, they don't deserve it. Well, maybe they don't deserve it, but God called you to give it anyway. God called you to bless them anyway. God called you to pray for your enemies anyway, regardless of what they deserve. So we go along in verse 11 as we keep track of the story. 
And this is the part I really want to camp out on for a little bit. So in verse 11, after Elisha says, look, go dip in the Jordan seven times. Elisha didn't even go out to meet him. Just send his messenger. Go tell him this. Which, which infuriated uh, Naaman. And, and he became angry. He stalked away. I thought he would certainly come out to meet him. And notice what Naaman says in verse, uh, I think it's 11. Well, it's verse 11 there. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy. Call the name of the Lord, his God, and heal me. I expected him to do this. Naaman is heading to Elijah's house. He has already played this scenario out in his mind. He already sees himself knocking on the door. Elijah comes out. Hey, man. Gives a big old hug, high five, whatever. And, and then he says, I have this condition. And Elijah says, no problem. Abracadabra. Boom. God be healed him. And, and that's what Naaman thought might happen. So as he's going, this is the picture that he has in his mind of, of how it's all going to go down. But he gets there and it doesn't go down like that. You ever been guilty of asking God for something and picturing it to go a certain way, but God doesn't quite answer it that way? And you're like, wait a minute, God, I didn't, I didn't expect it to go down like this. Naaman expected him. And, and as Christians, we put ourselves in a very precarious position when we present God with the multiple choice problem. And, and we, we, we present God, here's the problem. Let's say God... You know, I, I need you to meet this financial uh, situation, this financial need in my life. I need you to meet the financial need, God. So you can either, A, uh, you can have my boss give you a raise, or God, B, you can have me just find money laying on the ground. That would be pretty neat. Or C, God, you could, uh, you, you could have a rich relative that I don't even know anything about pass away and leave me a great inheritance, right? And those are the three options we give to God. God, you can A, B, or C. Here you go. Our God is not a multiple choice God. To, to give him A, B, and C is to put him in a box and say you can only answer my problem with these three solutions. But in doing so, we forget the other solutions that are out there. We forget option D that says God's going to give you a side job where you can earn a little extra income. We forget option E that says uh, God's going to have someone buy you groceries for a week so you can save the money you would have spent on groceries. We forget option F to, that says the IRS is going to contact you and say we didn't give you enough money back on your tax return, so here's more money. God can do miracles. <laughs> I know. <laughs> God can do miracles. It can happen. We present him with these Options, God, here's your multiple choice exam. And God says, no, I don't, I don't like choice A, B, or C. I'm going to go with choice Q, choice R. It might be choice Z, the last thing on your list. But if God is able to solve the problem, let it be Z, right? Let it be whatever. We can't present God with multiple choice. We give him the open-ended question. God, here it is. However you want to resolve it, it's yours. Here's the complicated issue. However you want to fix it. It's yours. Now, now, sometimes we can't help but to expect it to go down a certain way, right? Sometimes it's just human nature to come and expect it to happen a certain way. And that's fine as long as you don't get disappointed when God decides to do it a different way. You can have your expectations of A or B or C, but if God decides to go with E, F, or G, don't be upset about it. Just trust it in His intelligence that He is able to come up with a better solution uh, than you could have come up with on your own. So here Naaman is, he's expecting Elijah, he's expecting him just to wave his hand and then God miraculously heals him. He expects something grand to happen because this is a complicated issue. A skin disease is a complicated issue. If it would have been fixed easily, guess what? He would have already gotten it fixed. It's a complicated issue. So he's looking for something grand to occur, but instead he's told to go to a river and dip seven times. And in a dirty river, at that. I got a skin disease, and you want me to dip in a dirty river. See, I've already told y'all about how I don't like to swim in lakes because I can't see the bottom of the lake, and, and you hear all these conditions about flesh-eating bacteria and don't get in with the cut or, you know, whatever. And so I'm a little leery of that. Well, here, he has a skin disease, and he's told to dip in a dirty river. And even the thought of dipping, it just seems too simple to name. Seems too simple. You guys ever been wild about a magic trick? I like illusionists. I love it. I used to, I used to have the, the little, little magic kit when I was a kid. 
I, I used to love doing that kind of stuff. Uh, my brother-in-law and I, when we were um, older, we were teenagers and different things, uh, we would go to these theme parks where they would have the little magic shops. You know what I'm talking about? And we would love to go to those magic shops. And those guys, they would be in there and they'd do their 15-minute routine, right? They had six or seven tricks they would show you, their 15-minute routine, and they would blow your mind. And you were like, wow, how did you do that? And so at the end of the, the show, we would go up and we would say, then how did you do that one trick? And he said, well, you know, you can buy the trick, I can't tell you, but for $40, the trick can be yours. <laughs> for $40. And, and you know, your mind has just been blown. So to you, you justify it. You know, that's worth it, right? I mean, if I can amaze people like you just amazed me, I will give you the $40 because something inside of me must know the intricate secrets behind this magic trick, this illusion. And so I, 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 I have spent my fair share of $40 <laughs> once or twice. But I remember the feeling because I, I would pay the $40 for the mic and they would give me the trick. And I said, oh, I can't wait. I'm probably going to have to watch like a two-hour training video to perfect this, right? I'm going to have to read this thick manual just to, to get the sleight of hand just perfect. And, and I get the, the book that holds the secrets of this magic trick and you just feel the power in your hand. I mean, for 40 bucks, you just feel like this is going to be just a, an incredible secret that you're about to learn. It's going to be like the, the secret in the Mayan calendar or, or whatever that was. And so... You open it up and you're excited. Oh, I can't wait. Really? That's it? That's it? In that moment, it, it seems so simple. And, and you feel like you just got gypped. You feel like the guy just, just took pull one over on you, right? Because I just spent 40 bucks for you to tell me all you gotta do is make sure your hand is turned this way. Really? Really? I paid 40 bucks for something? that simple, and, and it's so simple that in your mind, you're like, people are going to figure this out, right? I mean, you can't. I, I can't do this trick. It's so simple. People are going to figure this out, but they don't. They don't. You can walk away and do that trick, and as simple as it might sound, it is oftentimes the simplest things that can have the most profound effects in our lives. They'll never figure it out because it's so simple. You ever go through a trial and, and you talk to a friend of yours and, and, and your friend gives you a simple piece of advice and this is the whole, the meat of this is that simple advice that we receive. Uh, you, you talk to a friend, you're going through something, you're struggling, you, you got a complicated issue and, and you want your friend to give you something really good, something deep, right? Something practical. And, and, and your friend says three words to you and those three words are pray about it. Pray about it. So how many of you, and let's, let's just get real in this place this morning. Can we get real Christians in this place this morning? How many of you have heard that suggestion, just pray about it, and you were not satisfied yeah, with yeah. that response? Yeah. How many of you, with that response, you, 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 you got tired of hearing people say, just pray about it, just pray about it, just pray about it. How many of you felt like that response was what people say when they don't know what else to say? They have no other opinions. They have no other knowledge or wisdom on the subject. So it's a cop-out response, right? It's just a cop-out for Christians. Just pray about it. I don't know what else to tell you. Just pray about it. And it seems so simple, doesn't it? And when we seem like it can't be that easy, there has to be something more to it than just praying about it. Elisha, Naaman would have said, Elisha, I appreciate your reputation as a healer and a miracle worker that God has used you, but this skin condition is complicated, and I need you to perform some complicated task in order to heal me, yet you give me a solution that's as simple as dipping in the Jordan River seven times. And Naaman can't accept the fact that, that something so complicated can be healed by something so simple. And his, his servant gets it. His officers get it. In verse number 13, they said, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? Well, yeah, I would have. So you certainly should obey him when he says, Go wash and be cured. How much more should you do it? One version says, If you come to me with an issue, Pastor Jeremy, I'm having an issue. Okay, let me tell it to you like this. Here's a 12 step resolution. If you follow these 12 steps, that issue will be resolved. You would go out and you would start those 12 steps, wouldn't you? But how many of you, on that same token, if I said just pray about it, would you go away feeling a little disappointed that I didn't give you more advice than just pray about it if we're honest with ourselves? How can something so simple 
be the answer because we view prayer as something so simple and it can't possibly be the answer. Uh, you ever help your kids with homework and, and their homework is so simple that it confuses everything out of you? I mean, my, my daughter is in second grade. My son is in kindergarten. I remember trying to help her with some first grade homework. And what you need to know about me is I tend to overanalyze things. I analyze everything. It can be a very good quality, but it can also kind of come back and bite you. And, and I look at this homework. Daddy, can you help me? Sure, baby. And I'm reading it. I'm like, it can't be that simple. There, there, there has to be more to it. I think I know the answer, but, but I'm the kind of kid that in school, I was always looking for the trick answer. Right? If it was too easy, there had to be a trick to it. I was always looking for the trick answer. It can't be that simple. It can't possibly be the right solution. However, as simple as prayer might sound in your life, it's the most powerful tool in your arsenal. It's the most powerful tool in your arsenal. See, we try to combat difficult situations with equally difficult tactics, but the most effective tactic that you and I have as Christians is, is the most basic and simple tactic of prayer. It's the most basic and simple tactic. When life gets complicated, keep it simple. James chapter 5 verse 16 says, The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and it produces wonderful results. Pastor, I have a complicated issue. What should I do? Pray about it. Oh, but pastor, that's too simple. Pray about it. Try it. Try it. I haven't tried it, Pastor. No, no, nothing's happening. Uh, so we start giving other solutions. Name it says Arthur Rivers of Havana and Par Par Better. Can I go dip in them? Let me make suggestions of other rivers. We do the same thing with God. We start making suggestions to God as if God is inviting us to a round table saying, come on, guys, I need your help on this one. I'm just in a total blank here. I don't know what the next step should be. Please, what do you recommend I do? God never invites us to that table, does he? Because we don't, we don't have to be at that table. Do you think the creator of the universe really needs our opinion on what the best solution might be? No, he's doing a pretty good job ruling the world himself. Doing a pretty good job of that. Yeah, but God seems to be drawing a blank. He seems to not know what's going on. Listen, if God is drawing a blank, that might just mean you need to pause where you are. If God has nothing to say on the matter, maybe God is really saying just hold tight for a little bit. Maybe God is saying to Moses, you know what, Moses? You need to learn some survival skills in the wilderness before I take you and lead an entire people out of slavery. I need you to stay in the field a little bit longer, David. Just pause in the field because if you can't learn how to protect sheep, you'll never be able to protect the kingdom. Sometimes when God draws a blank, it's not really a blank at all. It's just a pause. And we need to learn to roll with the pauses. Worship team, you can come on back up as we wrap this thing up this morning. In verse number 14, Naaman finally decides to do what Elijah requested. He went down to the Jordan River and he dipped himself seven times as the man of God instructed him. And his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child. There's something to be said about consistency here. Because Naaman wasn't asked to dip once. Not twice. Not three times. And in that moment, you, you gotta just ask yourself, you ever just God just called you to do something stupid and, and you're doing it. You're like, God, how much longer do I have to do this? Moses, I mean, excuse me, Noah building an ark. God, this is foolishness. Come on, man. Seriously. What do you got me doing? You know, is this is this just a tactic to try to keep me busy? What, what are you doing here? It's it's busy work, but but there's a purpose in it. And and sometimes God calls you to do silly stuff, but you gotta be persistent. And, and that name I just did four times. He would have been healed. And if they had just dipped five times or even six times and said, you know what? This is stupid. I'm getting out of here. This is ridiculous. I'm not going to be healed. I, he's just making me look like a fool. He just wants me to look foolish out here. That's what he's doing. But he didn't do it. In 2 Kings chapter 13, you'll see later on, Elisha, it is, as he's dying, he is approached by Jehoash, who's the king of Israel. And Jehoash visited Elisha. And Elisha told him, you know, get a bow, get some arrows, take a bow. Open the east window and shoot the arrows out. The Lord's arrow of victory is over Aaron. So he shot the arrow and he said, well, because of that, Elisha said, you will defeat the Arameans at Aphek. And then Elisha went on to say, now take the arrows that represent the victory and strike the ground. And the Bible says that the king, Jehoash, took the arrows and struck the ground. One, two, three. 
did what you told me to. But with that third strike, he stopped, and Elisha got infuriated. He was angry. Why did you just strike it three times? He says, because you didn't tell me how many times to strike it. And Elisha said, because you only struck it three times, you will only defeat the Arameans in three battles. You should have struck the ground five or six times. Then you would have completely destroyed it. But now you'll just destroy them on three battles. And after I read this, I thought, come on, Elisha, cut the guy some slack. You didn't give him a number. You know us guys. We need directions. Give me a number. I'll, I'll hit the ground as many times as you want me to hit the ground. Just tell me the numbers. But don't leave it open-ended. And the fact that Elijah left it open-ended and he just did it three times really upset him. And, and the only thing I can think about to compare the situation is the game of Simon Says. And how in Simon Says, you know, the leader who is Simon says, Simon Says, pat your head. So you start patting your head. And, and when do you stop patting your head? When Simon says to stop. Just because Simon says, pat your head, you don't do this and quit. You don't do this for, for a minute and then say, man, this is ridiculous. I quit. No. You keep patting your head until Simon says stop. Don't stop until Simon says so. Or don't stop till you get the results. God says pray. Don't stop praying until God shows you the results. I think about Elijah. When Elijah had prayed for rain. And he's there and he's praying for rain. And he sends a servant. Go check and see if rain is coming. The servant comes back. There's no sign of rain. Elijah keeps praying. Go see again. No sign of rain. Elijah keeps praying. And Elijah kept praying. And he kept sending out that servant. Until eventually the servant came back and said, I see the cloud the size of a man's hand. Elijah got up said, it's good enough for me. It's time to stop and move on to the next thing. He didn't stop praying until he saw the results. Is prayer simple? Yes, prayer is simple. Sometimes we overcomplicate it, but prayer is so simple. And it seems like such a simple resolution to the complicated problems in our lives. But as simple as prayer is, it is the most powerful weapon you have. Don't underestimate the power and the effectiveness of your prayer. There's an acronym for the word PUSH. You heard it? PUSH. Pray until something happens. That's when you can get off the hook. You're praying about a situation and nothing's changing. You're not off the hook until something changes. Keep praying over the situation. Yeah, but pastor, it's too simple. I know it's simple, but God chooses the simple things in the world to confound the wise. It's the simple things that he chooses. Whatever complications you have in life, I don't care how complicated your situation might be. When life gets complicated, keep it simple. Keep it simple. Return to the basics. God, we thank you.